The fundamental theorem of algebra tells us that polynomials whose coefficients are complex numbers can have only complex numbers as roots. In other words, we never need to look further than the field of complex numbers to find the roots of polynomials with complex coefficients. In this video, we're going to use the tools of abstract algebra to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra in the following way. We want to show that if I have a polynomial whose coefficients are complex numbers, then some of its roots are likely to be complex, but I suppose we should allow for the fact that at least one of them might not be. So if we, for some reason, needed to extend the complex numbers in order to find all roots of a polynomial with complex coefficients, then we have to understand what that implies about the relationship between that extension field and the complex number field. And what we're going to prove is that there is no non-trivial extension, non-trivial finite extension, of the complex number field that is not equal to the complex numbers itself. So in other words, this picture cannot happen. To make that proof work, we're going to need to know a lot about the structure of fields. We're going to need to know a lot about the structure of finite groups. We're going to need the Galois correspondence that lets us translate between those two worlds. And we need to understand a couple of basic facts about the fields of real and complex numbers. They're going to make this proof work. So here are the ingredients. First, we have the Galois correspondence from the Galois theory of fields. Remember, the Galois correspondence tells us that there is a one-to-one -one order reversing correspondence between intermediate field extensions and subgroups of the Galois group of that total extension. That degrees of those extensions agree with the indices of those corresponding subgroups, and that normal extensions correspond to normal subgroups and automorphism groups to the quotients of those automorphism groups. Remember the Galois correspondence, what we're going to use it for is to translate back and forth between those two worlds, the world of intermediate fields and the world of subgroups. We can use the Galois correspondence to go back and forth one to the other as long as E over F is a normal and separable extension. The second body of knowledge that we need is some knowledge about the structure of the subgroups of finite groups. A couple of theorems called Seelov's theorems are going to come in handy. So first of all, let's look at the second one written here. If I have a group whose order is a power of a prime number, so p to the k, then this theorem is going to tell us that that group must have a subgroup whose order is equal to each of the smaller prime powers. Okay. So if my whole group has order p to the k, then that group must have a subgroup of order p to the k, p to the k minus 1, p to the k minus 2, and so on and so on, all the way down to p. Okay. So every smaller prime power will be realized by a subgroup of G having that many elements. Secondly, if the order of our group is not strictly a prime power, but is a prime power times something else, then the other Seelov theorem here is going to tell us that there exists what's called a maximal P subgroup of that group. In other words, there exists a subgroup H such that the order of H is P to the K, and the index in G of that subgroup is equal to m, and p to the k times m is equal to the order of the group, and m is not divisible by p. In other words, any prime power factor of the order of the group G, its maximal prime power will be realized as the order of a subgroup of G. So these are the two facts about finite group theory that we're going to need in order to get to a proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Finally, we need some special facts about the complex field and the real subfield of the complex field. And these facts come from outside the realm of abstract algebra for the most part. First of all, we need the result that every polynomial whose coefficients are real, if that polynomial has an odd degree, then there's no way for that polynomial to avoid having at least one real root. This can be proven in calculus using the intermediate value theorem, because any polynomial of odd degree will approach positive infinity as t goes to one of the extremes, and negative infinity as t goes to the other extreme. And because it's a continuous function, it must therefore cross through the t-axis and therefore have a root, which is a real number. We also have the square root property in the complex field. Namely, every complex number z has a complex square root. We can prove that actually directly. If z is equal to a plus bi, then its square root, one of its square roots at least, 
has the form listed right here that's made up of that combination of square roots. And we know that each one of those square roots is going to be a real number because the number underneath the radical is going to be positive in each case. And every positive real number has a real square root. So every complex number has a complex square root. And a consequence of that, because of the quadratic formula, is that every quadratic polynomial of complex coefficients will have complex roots. So this is a very special case of the fundamental theorem of algebra in degree two. But we're going to see that that degree two special case is actually going to be enough to give us the entire statement that every polynomial with complex coefficients has complex roots. So the job of the rest of this proof is going to be to figure out how to cross out the word quadratic in the statement of this last uh, bullet point right here and show that every polynomial with complex coefficients must have only complex roots. So the first thing we want to do is suppose that E is a finite extension of the complex field. We want to prove that therefore E must be a trivial extension. In other words, that E must be equal to the complex field itself. Well, the first thing that we might have to do, if E is not a normal extension of the real numbers, then let's replace E by its normal closure over the real numbers. After all, we need E to be a normal extension of R in this diagram in order to use the Galois correspondence. Remember, we can only use the Galois correspondence with a total extension that's both normal and separable. We get the separability automatically because of the characteristic of the real field being 0. But the normality we only get if we replace E by its normal closure if necessary. If we can show that the normal closure of E is trivial over the complex numbers, in other words, if the normal closure of E is equal to C, then that must mean that E itself is equal to C. So uh, we can, without loss of generality, assume that our extension field E is actually a normal extension of the reals. And we get a field diagram like the one that's over here on the left. And the Galois correspondence, therefore, gives us a diagram of subgroups like the one that's over here on the right, where G here is going to be the Galois group of E over R, and K is going to be the Galois group of E over C. So here's what we have so far. What we want to do now is to build up some group structure over on the right-hand side and use the Galois correspondence to translate that into field structure over on the left-hand side. Let's see how that works. First, let's hit it with Seelof's first theorem that says that the group G, if its order is equal to 2 to the K times M, where M is an odd number, then there must exist one of these maximal two subgroups inside of G. In other words, there must exist a subgroup H inside of G whose index in G is equal to M, and therefore the order of H is equal to 2 to the K. So we must have a group diagram like the one that's over here on the right, with H being a subgroup of G with index M, and M is an odd number. Then all we have to do is port that understanding over to the left using the Galois correspondence. The existence of that index m subgroup h inside of g implies the existence of a degree m extension of the reals. Let's call it f. And now f is an intermediate field between the real numbers and e on the left-hand side. And the degree of f over r is an odd number. But what do we know about polynomials over the reals that have odd degree? We know that they have to have at least one real root. Therefore, the only way for f to be an odd degree extension of r is for there to be an irreducible polynomial over r of odd degree. But the only irreducible polynomials over the reals that have odd degree must have degree 1. Because if they had degree any more than 1, then we would have an irreducible polynomial over r with that degree. And if it's irreducible over r, that means it has no roots in r. But we know every polynomial of odd degree over r must have a root. Therefore, the degree of f over r must be equal to 1. And if the degree of f over r is equal to 1, that must mean that the subgroup h over on the right is equal to the whole group g. So what does that mean? It means that the whole group g has to have an order which is a power of 2, merely because we can't have an odd degree extension of the reals unless that degree is equal to 1. So we find out that this g has no subgroup of odd index, no proper subgroup of odd index. Therefore, g, the Galois group of e over r, must have degree which is a power of 2. Now looking on the right-hand side, if g has a degree which is a power of 2 and k, which is a subgroup of g, 
uh, is in between the trivial group and G, that must mean that K also has an order which is a power of 2. Now we'll port that understanding over to the left-hand side. That's going to show that the degree of E over R must be a power of 2, and therefore that the degree of E over C must be a power of 2. So now we've shown that if I take a finite extension of the complex numbers, that that finite extension has to have a degree which is a power of 2. And that's merely because of the tower law. After all, the degree of the extension E over R has to be the equal to the product of the degree of E over C and the degree of C over R. And if E over R has a degree which is a power of 2, then E over C must be a divisor of a power of 2. But because 2 is prime, the only divisors of powers of 2 are themselves powers of 2. All right, I think I've belabored that point enough, but it's really important. So now let's presume that that power of 2 which characterizes the degree of E over C, or equivalently, which characterizes the order of the Galois group K, let's presume that that's greater than or equal to 2. So that's a, it's a non-trivial extension here. Then that must mean, according to Seeloff's second theorem, that there exists a subgroup L that has order equal to half the order of K. In other words, its index, the index of L in K, is equal to 2. Because if K has prime power order, then it must have a subgroup of every smaller prime power order. And so there's enough room here. If 2 to the L is greater than or equal to 2, then there's enough room for a proper index 2 subgroup inside of K. Let's call it L. But then the Galois correspondence will imply that that index 2 subgroup that we found of K corresponds to a degree 2 extension of the complex numbers. Let's call it D. But if there is an index 2 extension of the complex numbers over here on the left-hand side, then using an analogous argument to when we argued about f over r before, that degree 2 extension of the complex numbers will imply the existence of an irreducible quadratic polynomial of complex coefficients. But we happen to know that every quadratic polynomial over the complex numbers must have complex roots and therefore cannot be irreducible. Therefore, there is no such quadratic extension of the complex numbers that's non-trivial. So this is clearly absurd. But if it's absurd, what exactly did we contradict? We contradicted the assumption that there was enough room in the group K to fit a subgroup of index 2. So we assumed that the order of k was greater than or equal to 2 in order to make this contradiction. But now that we've contradicted that, we can't sustain the assumption that the order of k is greater than or equal to 2. That must mean that the order of k, since it has to be a power of 2, must therefore be equal to 1. Therefore, k, which is the Galois group of E over c, must be a trivial group. And because E over c is a normal extension, that implies by the Galois correspondence one last time that E and C must be the same field. And there's a proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Just running back through it one more time, how did it work? If we have an extension field of the complex numbers, then over the reals, we can show that that extension has to have a degree which is a power of 2. Because if not, then there would have existed an odd degree polynomial over the reals, which was irreducible. But that's not possible because every odd degree polynomial over the reals has a root by the intermediate value theorem. Therefore, E over R has to have degree 2 to the k. But then that must mean E over C has a degree which is also a power of 2, according to the Tower Law. But if E over C has a degree which is a power of 2, then we showed that Unless that power of 2 is equal to 1 itself, then there is room for a quadratic extension of the complex numbers. But we can only have a quadratic extension of the complex numbers if there exists an irreducible quadratic whose coefficients are complex. And that's not possible, because in the complex field, every number has a square root, and therefore every quadratic polynomial in C has complex roots. So by that series of contradictions, we have now proven that every finite extension of the complex numbers must be trivial, and therefore any polynomial with complex coefficients can have only complex roots, proving the fundamental theorem of algebra.